I also have an announcement that I want to make before I get into the presentation, and that is uh, to make you guys aware that the next New England lectureship uh, will be held May the 3rd through the 5th of next year. Uh, May the 3rd through the 5th, uh, and we will be uh, at the same location we were this year. And so for those who weren't with us, uh, we were in Mansfield at the Envision Hotel. Again, that is uh, May the 3rd through the 5th, New England lectureship. Uh, we have uh, some exciting keynote speakers that have already been confirmed. Uh, Billy McGuigan, who was scheduled to be with us this year, but who had to cancel out on us, will be with us next year. Uh, David Yasko, we had him a couple of years ago from Houston. He'll be back with us. And Danny has already agreed to be one of our speakers next year. You, you do remember our conversation, right? I do. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. okay, all right, okay. Okay. Uh, so we're hoping that uh, you guys can come and be a part of that uh, activity. So uh, this go round, I did not forget to give you the handout. So Mike and uh, others are distributing that right now. Uh, I want to ask a question. What changes have you observed in our society in the last uh, several years? What, what changes have you observed? Uh, just raise your hand and shout it out. What changes have you observed uh, in our society in the last several years? Okay, uh, uh, dramatic dr uh, lack of respect for the Bible, okay. COVID-19. COVID a lot of disrespectful behaviors, like people trying to like, do sexual things you're not supposed to do, like become a woman or a man. Okay. LGBT stuff and just really disrespecting the Christian church and that because they don't think there's any biblical views and it's going to really battle between the church and the community of those people. Okay, so amen to all that you said. Okay, <laughs> what else? Okay, increasing government opposition. Okay, what else? Break down in our criminal justice system. Okay, break down in our criminal justice system. Okay. Politics. Politics. Apathy from people who used to not be apathetic. Okay, apathy uh, from people who used to not be apathetic. Uh, people are changing their views and, and not getting as bothered by things that are going on as they once uh, did. Bad inflation. What's that? Bad inflation. Okay, bad inflation. Uh, how about the weakening of our congregations? How about the breakdown of families? Now, as the family goes, so goes the congregation. And so I hope we recognize that uh, many of the problems that we see occurring in our congregations are problems that really are happening in the, in the families that are part of our congregation, and they soon will surface themselves at our building. And so I, I ask that question because uh, we have been called to be biblical men in a changing world. And so many of the changes that we've talked about are because men are not standing like we ought to. Individuals who, who are God's people, in particular, are allowing things to happen in our congregations uh, that is having a detrimental effect on the influence we should be having on the world. And so the reality is the world has influenced us a whole lot. And many times we're not saying anything about this. And when we finally address some of these issues, guess what? It's too late. The cat is out the bag, and the cat's not going back in the bag. And so as biblical men, we need to stand on, on our watch post and address some things and not just be silent about it and not just be con uh, I'll, I'll think that uh, if I don't say anything about it, that won't make it worse. It's already worse. And many of the things you've already talked about. So let's, let's look at uh, some of the things I prepared on the handout. We live in a society where men are no longer valued as being important. The breakdown of the family. Uh, somebody talked about the government. We, we, we have a government situation that will pay a woman more money if she lives by herself than if she's married. Now imagine what that does to the children uh, that she has, who dad is not actively involved in the home. 
look at some of the movies and some of the TV programs that we see and, and look at how the father or the husband is depicted. Uh, some of them, he's depicted as a buffoon. Uh, mama is the one solving all the problems. He's creating all the problems. Imagine young people who they're growing up seeing that and that there's no counter to that. How do you think that's going to impact them? Somebody's already talked about the fact that uh, we, our society, no longer looks at the church and religion as being anything that's important. I can remember when, when the preacher man was a highly respected person in our communities. Can anybody remember that besides me? Uh, that's not the case now. And part of that is because in the larger religious community, uh, the people that we're working with trying to reach, they're seeing all the scandals uh, that have occurred uh, in the name of religion. And, and, and for non-Christians, they lump all of us together. But that's having an impact on people's view of us and on manhood. Churches are getting smaller and they're diminishing. I don't think I need to say anything about that. Uh, we all know that to be a fact. And we read, we read the stories, and depending on where you want to go for your information, a significant number of churches are closing every year. So all this has significant impact to our longevity. And, and part of what I am seeing is when people don't address the issues that are already there, uh, by the time the next generation comes on, the, the congregation falls apart, and by that time, the family has fallen apart. And so as we have been called to be biblical men, we've been called to be courageous and stand strong, or we've been called to stand with the word of God and have confidence that God will be with us and that we don't need to worry and, and think that we're out there by ourselves. Uh, we are being called to put our faith in action. We're being called to say all the good stuff that we say in Bible class, you know, start living that. Because, again, it becomes easier to talk about being a Christian than it is living as one. There's no secret that we're losing many young people to denominationalism or many of them are just dropping out of church, period. Now, we need to be aware that there, there, in many congregations, there's a big generation gap between the people who are leading the congregation and many of the people who are attending. So if, if all your leadership is 60 and over, 60, 70, 80 years old, and you got a large number of young adults, these millennials, these Gen Zs, X and Ys and Zs, we didn't grow up dealing with folk like that. And they are a whole new breed of folk who they don't, they don't come to church services just because it's Sunday. Many of us grew up, it's Sunday, you're going to worship, you're going to church services. Uh, their attitude is, you need to give me a reason to come. You, you need to give me a reason uh, to take my Sunday uh, and, and be devoted to this when I can do so many other things. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's just a, the nature of the beast that we're dealing with. And we need to learn how to understand those people and how to reach them with the word of God. And we can do it, but it's going to require uh, some effort on our part. We've already talked about the increasing shortage of preachers. But look at the, these other issues that are here. Uh, when it comes to instrument of music and worship, women preachers, uh, praise teams, women leading in the worship services, uh, changing of the name on our buildings to be more pleasing to non-Christians, acceptance of practicing homosexuals in congregations and even into leadership. Now, now these are things that are happening because men of God are not standing. This is in the church of Christ here, so I can be very clear. And the only way this could happen in our congregation is that biblical manhood, standing for what's right, standing on the word of God, is not at the forefront. And we're trying to appease people. Uh, we're trying to make people feel comfortable not understanding the gospel, the word of God, is designed to clearly delineate between God's standard and the standards of the world. So you and I don't have, have to apologize for people about what the scriptures teach and what we preach. 
uh, they either accept it because it's the word of God or they reject it. But we don't have to change it. Now, see, again, this is happening in our congregations, and it's happening because men are not standing. I was looking at a, a Brotherhood advertisement a couple of days ago, and even on some of our lectureships and things like that, we, we are, people are being invited to speak on that, on those things who have instrumental music in their services, but they also have an a cappella service. Or they're expanding the role of women in leadership. Uh, and, I, and, I, and let me just say this. Uh, I believe women can do more than teach babies and prepare communion. But I think God has clearly delineated that she is not to be a part of the leadership of a congregation. And I think one of the rebellions that we're having in our congregations with our sisters is we have not uh, allowed them to exercise the spiritual gifts that they have in God-ordained ways. And so you've got to know the scriptures in order to be able to deal with educated women who want to do certain kinds of things because it's happening in other, 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 uh, other congregations. And so if we're going to be biblical man, men, then we'll need to stand. We hate the sinner, or we hate, we hate the sin, but we love the sinner. And so I, I'm working with our people now in our congregation to help them understand homosexuality is just like lying. It's just like drugging. Uh, it's just like fornicating. They're all sin to God. Uh, we have made big sins and little sins. And in the process of doing that, we've almost acted like we can't evangelize homosexuals. We can't evangelize people who are in, uh, in lifestyles and behaviors that are uncomfortable for us. But in the world that we live in now, you may very well have homosexuals at your congregation. Uh, they're closeted because of our stereotypical uh, ways we address them. Instead of recognizing it's a sin just like any of the other sins. And I do believe God will forgive sinners. Right? Is that what's taught in scripture? Okay, have you been forgiven? And, and so I raise all those issues really to help us to begin to see that this is a personal issue that we need to be thinking about. Because if we don't have biblical men leading and standing in our congregation, biblical men in our families, then 10 years from now, some of these things that we think would never happen at our congregation may very well happen. Because nobody is mentoring people to begin to help them to understand what thus saith the Lord, and it's not up for compromise. It's not about being popular. It's not about being well-liked. It's about being right with God. And when we create a culture uh, in our congregation and in our communities where the word of God is always to be honored, it's to be respected, it's to be held high, then that helps us to move further along this direction than what, so that we can preserve or help maintain what God has already established. And so I wanted to look at uh, David uh, three, three things about David, and I'm going to ask you guys to read uh, those passages that are there about uh, David. Now, before we do that, what, what do you know about David? You guys are all Bible students. What do you know about David? He was a man after God's own heart. Okay, what else do you know about David? He was an adulterer. Okay, okay. He's a murderer. From, from Saul. Okay, from Saul. Okay. He's a forgiven sinner. Okay, he's a forgiven sinner. He was a psalmist. He was a shepherd. And, and, I, and I raise those issues because <clears throat> David is a man who the Bible shows us the good things about him, but it also shows us the not so good things about him. And yet God still calls him a man after his own heart. The reality is the people that we deal with are flawed. 
They have a whole lot of issues. But God can still use them. Think about yourself. Are you perfect? Well, if I ask your wives, I know what I hear from them. And for those of you who are youth, if I ask your mamas, I know what I hear from her. And, and so I raise that issue to help us understand uh, many times we, we, we hold standards so high that nobody can measure up, not even us. But because we're the ones holding the standards, it's very easy uh, to knock down everybody else. And so there's some things that we can learn about David's life. For example, in 1 Samuel 18, 14, what does the Bible say? When David had success in all his undertakings, the Lord was with him. David was successful because God was with him. Now, think about that in the midst of all that you know about David. Because he, he didn't always do what was right. And on top of that, I didn't hear about David was a bad father. We can have some, some good church leaders who are bad family men. But he was successful. First Chronicles 29, 28. What does it say? First Chronicles 29, 28. What does it tell us about David? Okay. So I, I raised that, that scripture to say, how do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be remembered? You guys know you're writing your obituary every day. How, how, do, how do you want to be remembered? So in spite of all that happened with David, uh, look at what that verse says about him when it came to the end of his life. And then Acts 13, 22, uh, we've already talked about that, where it mentions that David was a man after God's own heart. So we already know David wasn't perfect. We already know he had some issues. So what made him a man after God's own heart? What was it about David's character? What was it? He, was, he had humility? Great faith, what? He trusted in God. He was repentant. I like the fact when David was confronted with his sin, he didn't try to hide behind it. He acknowledged it. And one of the things that we need to be willing to do is when we are found or exposed uh, as not being what we should be or doing what we ought to do, we need to have the humility and the re repentant heart that David had. That helps us have credibility with the people who are around us because when we mess up, people know we messed up whether we acknowledge it or not. And the more out front you are in leading people and dealing with people, the more people see us. Uh, I think sometimes we forget we, uh, we live in glass houses. Whether you want it or not, you, you live in a glass house. And, and we need to respect that process that eyes are always on us. Even when you don't want them to be on you. Even when you try to take a vacation. Even when you come to a men's retreat eyes on you. And so I say all of that to get to where I want to get to uh, right here, which is what, what can we do to be biblical men in a changing society? What can we do as our world will continue to change? Now, the message of the word of God does not change, cannot change. But our methods and our outreach may need to be tweaked every now and then to deal with the culture that we're trying to lead to Jesus. I think sometimes uh, we, be, we, we become so inwardly focused that we forget our mission is to go out and make disciples. And sometimes you need to leave the 99 to go out and get that one. So what can we do? First thing we can do is we can stand up and be men. 
it used to be said a man's word was his bond. Anybody remember those kind of expressions? That, that you know, if a, if a man promised you something, he said he was going to do something, uh, he stayed with it. Uh, you didn't have to sign no contract. All, you, all it took was a handshake. Because we valued our word. We need to value the word of God. And so when we're confronted with people who want to change it, who want to alter it, the answer is no. How can we? We don't have that authority. God has not given us that, that option to do that. So we stand. And we can't let fear of retaliation or what people may say about us or people may assassinate your character. Uh, I think folk did that to Jesus, didn't they? I think somebody called him a wine bibbler. He's a friend of sinners. Uh, you guys remember that? And so if we're going to be serious about carrying out the Lord's work and, and standing for what he is stood for, recognize everybody, especially ungodly folk, immature folk, are not going to stand that. Let's just make sure we're walking in the footsteps of Jesus when we do it so that we don't get caught up in something. If we're going to stand, then we're going to need to learn how to take risk. Not careless risk. Uh, this passage in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 reminds us God can do more than any of us could imagine. The um, Bedford Street Church of Christ in Abington, we moved there about two and a half years ago. We were the Church of Christ in Milton. And we were, we were outgrowing the space. Uh, we were leasing that building. Uh, and the owner of the building didn't want to sell. We also didn't want to fix up the building. And so we recognize it's time for us to go. And in the process of looking for a new church home, God blessed us with a location in Abington, Mass, where we purchased a building, three acres of land, all the office equipment, uh, all of the electronics, you know, all of the plates and forks and whatever was there, uh, that group left it there, and we were able to do that for less than a million dollars. Now, you, you know, you, you, you're going to pay more than a million dollars for an acre of land. Nobody but God could do that. And as a result of that, we have been able to do significant ministry in that area. Oh, and by the way, our offering has increased. And so while we have some people who left our congregation, our offering has increased because the people who are there are vested in what we're trying to do. Now, we took a risk. But we trusted God. And God is blessing us in the process. Which goes back to this, uh, this statement. Trust God more, depend on him more. A Proverbs writer will, will remind us that we need to lean not on our own understanding. And so sometimes in our business meetings, our finance meetings, we talk dollars and, and, and cents. And there's no faith in there at all. What about trusting God? Now, we're not talking about doing anything outrageous and, and whatnot. We're not talking about mortgaging the building and things like that. But there, there's a lot more meaningful ministry work that we can do if we are not bound uh, by certain traditions. Or we're not blinded by, okay, we can't do that. Well, why can't we do that? If the cattle on a, th uh, on a thousand hills belongs to him, why, why can't we do it? People need to see us move in faith, and they'll fall in line. I think that's going back to uh, the, one of the points that Danny made in his presentation this morning. People will follow a man of God. A wife will follow a husband who's godly. Children will line up on a father who exemplifies and who is a role model of what he's telling them they ought to be doing. And so as godly men, we need to take responsibility 
for the things that are under our control. So the first thing we need to take responsibility for is our own personal behavior. We, we can't lead God other people if we're not where we want them to go. And, and I'm sure many of you grew up with people telling folk what they ought to do. Uh, don't look at me. Just do what I tell you to do. Well, how did that work? It, it, it works better when someone can say, do as you see me do. Say what you hear me say. Go where you see me go. And so as we bring our own behavior into compliance, and if the Holy Spirit is governing our lives, that's what is actually going to happen. Let's take responsibility for the spirituality of our family. We're the leaders of our homes. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I want to see my wife and my son grow in the faith. And whatever it is I can do to help them grow in the faith, that's what I'm going to do. I want them to feel that they are secure that Ma because Maurice is in the house. Now, they can do that because of what they have seen me do on their behalf. Okay, my wife saw me will my willingness to move up here to a place I didn't want to come because I was concerned about her growth and development. Uh, my son has seen me uh, not be at home on anniversaries and birthdays. And, and if you are a leader, you know you, you've had those times where things come up where you can't be there. Uh, but guess what? I'm going to make up for it. I'm, I'm going to do something double special uh, when I get back. And so we need to take some responsibility for our own family. Those are things that are in our control. We need to take responsibility for evangelistic efforts. We talk to the congregation about them being evangelistic. Okay, men, brothers, husbands, fathers, are we evangelistic? It's one thing to tell other folk to do it, but are we doing it? And we can't say because of this work, that work, I don't have time to do it. Well, if you don't have time to do it, why are you telling other folk to do it? So this year, how many people have you led to Jesus? This year, how many people have you talked about, uh, talked to about Jesus? This, many, this time, this year, how many people have you invited uh, to the worship services or invited over to your house uh, to have a discussion with them or start a relationship with them uh, that can lead to some evangelistic kinds of discussion? If we want to be men of God, these are the kind of practical kinds of things that we can do right now. We don't need anybody else involved. We need to do these kind of things. And what we will see is that God will bless us if we will do what we're supposed to do. Now, as, as we work and do these kind of things, we got to be prepared for opposition. There's going to be opposition from those who are within and opposition from those who are without. That's always the case. Uh, you plus God is a majority. You plus God is a majority. Or said differently, God and you are the majority. So, so why do we let people intimidate us? Why, why do we let people intimidate us from being the best that we can do, offering the best service that we can offer uh, for our God? The world is changing, and it's going to continue to change. And there are going to be new things that are coming out there. Uh, we just got through COVID-19. COVID-20 is coming at some point. Okay, we deal with it. Uh, God hasn't gone on vacation when these things happen. He's still on the throne. He's still in control. Uh, we just have to have faith and do what he's told us to do. When the winds of change come as it relates to uh, individuals who want to teach false doctrine, what are we going to do? Well, we know what we ought to do. Stand against them. Mark them, call them out, note them. Don't just call them. Because as a man of God, we're not just concerned about our congregation. We're concerned about all the congregations. 
So if a, if a troublemaker left the Bedford Street congregation and came to you all's congregation, I'm obligated to let you know. You know, this person's coming over there. I just need for you to know they're a troublemaker. Now, you can say, I don't care what you said, Maurice. I'm just happy we got another member. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and I don't know about you, but I've seen people who've done that uh, 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 out of courtesy, ministers, elders have, have communicated some things with them to help them understand, be careful of this person. And people would ignore it and put them in leading roles and stuff like that. And then when trouble comes, uh, then they're acting like they weren't forewarned about it. As a man of God, activities like the one we're at this weekend are important in our personal growth and development. And the only reason my son is not here is he's working this weekend and he has a class tomorrow. Uh, but I encourage him. I'm mentoring him uh, because I don't know when I'm going to die. Uh, but if I die tomorrow, I want him to take care of his mama. So I'm preparing him for that. And then I'm preparing him for the time when he's responsible enough to have a wife. You know how, I'm, how, I'm, how I am preparing him for that? By the way, I'm treating his mama. So he's watching me as I interact with my wife. Uh, he's seeing the things that I'm doing for her. He's hearing some of the conversations uh, that we have. I share with him uh, the joys and the challenges of being married. Now, I don't get too personal with him on that, but I just let him know that even a woman that you love, you, you're going to get crossed up with her every now and then. But crossed up with her does not mean we divorcing. It just means we got crossed up on something and we're going to straighten it out. And we're going to smile and be happy and keep on kicking. So in the world that we are living in, with all of the continual ch uh, changes that are going on, the constant needs to be we're going to stick with God. And then we're going to develop relationships with other men who stick with God. No long range of Christians. And too many times we, we do things in isolation and we don't recognize we need support. We, we need support. And so one of the things I've tried to do this weekend, because many of you I did not know, I know you now. I know some names and some faces, and so I'm going to link up with you. You're going to get a phone call or an email from me after uh, this weekend uh, because you're my brother in Christ, and I may need you. I, I may get in a situation where I need some good godly counsel, and I hope I can call on you. I hope you won't say, well, you're not a member of my congregation, so I don't have time to talk to you right now. No, we, we're brothers, and we're part of the same body. We just meet in different locations, and we need to care about one another. And so I want to leave you with this, this question. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? And I, I don't have an answer for it. I'm just leaving that on your mind. Uh, so I'm going to like, pull a Danny on you guys. I'm, I'm going to give you this to think about tonight. <laughs> it's your homework. Uh, where, where do we go from here? Uh, because when we leave Gandenbrook tomorrow going back home, we ought to be different. We ought to be different. Uh, we ought to have a heightened awareness of the need for us to be God's man and for us to link up with other men of God. We need to sharpen each other. Uh, iron sharpens iron. Anybody read that? Yeah, somewhere, somewhere in there. And, and, and so we need to recognize that's, that's a part of one of the benefits of this kind of gathering. And so now we got some new resources, some new people resources that we can interact with, contact, uh, and if we can be of service to one another, we ought to do that. Uh, I'm a big... A uh, fan of, okay, why should I have to fly somebody in from five states over to do a uh, workshop or some kind of training when we got folk right in the area who are just as effective as that person? So where do we go from here? 
And I know that our time is just about up. So I'm, I'm leaving you my contact information right there. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I appreciate the conversations that we had after the earlier session. Um, uh, I appreciate some of the sharing that you guys did. I appreciate some of the questions that you uh, gave. Uh, and I'm just, again, thankful to be here uh, to share uh, just a little bit on, on this program this weekend. Uh, I want to honor the, the relaxation time that you guys got going on. But if there's a question somebody wants to throw out or a comment somebody wants to make, uh, you know, we take a minute or two to do, to do that. 